Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Nick and Kaveh for inviting me and organizing this workshop. Also, Randy, that was a really interesting talk and uh, related to a lot of the research that I also I'm doing at AFRL. Uh, this this talk right here is more of um, some results from a previous journal article that was recently accepted. And kind of towards the end, I'll talk about some of the extensions that would I would like to try to build off of this. Um, but it's estimating the Euclidean distances to features and the Euclidean trajectory of a monocular camera. Um, so this is full scale, not uh, up to a scale factor um, using monocular cameras. So some of the motivation, uh, like what Randy was talking about and Warren earlier, uh, is related to target tracking and intermittent feedback. Um, so and kind of in the top picture, you can see uh, or in, you can think of a lot of other examples, but if you're trying to track some targets, especially in multiple target cases, you're going to have them leave the field of view. So in the top case, um, just from TAS objective, you can see this quarter that's pushing these plates around. Um, as it's trying to push one of the plates, others will just leave the field of view. Um, so it has to, you know, purposefully because of the task is required to have other objects leave the field of view. Um, and the other video just below that, um, this one, uh, we're kind of limiting the operating region for the aircraft. This is just a quadrotor and a, a turtle bot. Um, and the turtle bot's trajectory is taking some path out of the field of view that we're just constraining the vehicle to not be able to leave, uh, or the, the tracking vehicle to not be able to leave. Um, and there, there's a number of examples where uh, this kind of happens. And, and all of these cases, what we're really interested in is uh, not just estimating the position of a target, but also um, not relying on GPS for our own estimates of our position. So we want to be able to both estimate targets, positions, and our own um, in these types of scenarios. Um, so the focus of this talk is kind of on only stationary objects uh, for now, but I'd like to extend to moving objects and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later. Um, and so we're focusing just, this, this result just focuses on, if you have one object and one camera, this is just a quadrotor in this picture here, but the later experiments I'll show will just be for a ground vehicle. Um, you wanna estimate the pose of, of your vehicle using some set of features. Um, and in this case, we have a checkerboard and we're using a structure from motion based approach for the monocular camera, uh, which you know relies on a key and current frame. I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with this, so I won't go too much into that. But in my mind, the main reasons for doing structure from motion and using monocular cameras um, is because you don't always know what objects you're looking at. Maybe you haven't registered landmarks or something like that uh, in an environment that you're in. Uh, so you know now you're just grabbing arbitrary features from that environment. Um, and trying to use those and then generate new landmarks using those features. Um, but you could still take advantage of existing landmarks in monocular and structure from motion approaches. Um, and also a lot of the cases that we're looking at, you just can't really use stereo cameras or uh, RGBD cameras uh, because, I mean, in this case right here, the, you could, but in a lot of the cases that we're looking at, you know, you'll be flying at kind of too high of an altitude uh, to be able to use some of those, uh, to have multiple cameras on a on an aircraft that you have sufficient parallax to be able to get reliable depth estimates. Um, so this, this is kind of the focus of my talk is uh, based off of pose estimation and the uh, using structure from motion type approaches. Uh, and so one of the primary differences uh, that I'm, I'm using between existing and uh, what I'm showing is, you know, the typical pixel uh, to normalize Euclidean coordinate model is something like what I've shown here, uh, where you you know you'll have UV pixel coordinates. If you know your intrinsic matrix, you know you can get uh, these normalized Euclidean coordinates. Um, but instead of using those, what I do is I normalize that and just use a unit vector. Uh, to kind of give you the direction. Um, 
you know, you all it requires no additional information. You just rep it's just representing it in a different form. Um, and the main reason that I do that is, like I said, we're interested in some of these target tracking applications, um, and we're interested in navigation where we might be going over a really large distance. And if we maybe don't only have a, a downward facing camera, a lot of the time our features that were something that we're tracking might leave our field of view. But as you guys know, for inverse depth, you'll go through a singularity uh, because the depth will pass through zero when the it goes past the image plane. Um, but if you're using a univector approach, instead you estimate these distances, uh, you avoid that problem um, and you're able to continue your estimate. And the only time that you have a singularity is when you make contact with a feature. Um, but if you've crashed or in some other cases, maybe you want to make contact, uh, then you know, you're know you probably done. <laughs> so um, anyway, so the, the focus of uh, this talk here, I'm going to show some of the things that we know and what we assume uh, we know and what we don't know. Uh, and this is uh, the kinematics for one of these types of you know, basic scenario where you'll have a keyframe and you know, your camera moves along from the top left where your keyframe is to the bottom left where you have a current frame. You're just looking at some stationary object. Um, and in my case, I'm, I'm assuming you have at least four features so you could use homography, uh, but you know, you could use something more, uh, some of these more robust algorithms like Cave's Quest or um, Fundamental or Essential, any of these types of methods if you have more features. Um, but this, this doesn't really assume any of that. It just says, assume that you have one of these methods you can use. Um, and from that, you can get the rotation and the direction of motion um, of the camera by tracking this set of features on a stationary object. Uh, and so I write these positions um, in a way where it's the unit vector direction, which I just show as a U, you know, the feature SI with respect to C um, in, in each of these things. So K is the keyframe, C is the camera, SI is the ith feature. Um, and what we don't know in this case is the distances. Um, so that we don't know the distance to the features at any point in time or the initial time. Uh, and we don't know the distance that we have traveled yet. So what we want to estimate is, you know, figure those things out. But I do make one kind of large assumption here, and that's that I can I can directly know the velocity and angular velocity of the camera, um, which, as some other people have pointed out, is hard. It is a hard problem to to estimate. Um, but in this case, we're doing it um, for these experiments at least. I'm doing it on a, a mobile robot, uh, so those are directly measurable. Um, but Anyway, so using these, we're going to try and estimate the distances. And the way that I approach this is you can write the equation for the position for any of the features uh, at any point in time as the position that the cameras traveled, this PK with respect to C, uh, and then the rotation of the um, initial position of the feature. Uh, so those, those are related. And you can put it into this kind of regressor form. Um, and assuming that you have the, a sufficient type of motion, uh, specifically your direction of motion and your uh, direction to the feature are not collinear, uh, then you have uh, an invertible, well, the pseudo inverse of this matrix will exist. And you can write the distances, the time varying distances of the, um, the distance the cameras traveled and the distance to the feature currently as a function of the initial distance and these measurable quantities in psi, um, which is just represented uh, just below there. And another th thing about doing it this way is the distances, the uh, rate of change of those distances is measurable uh, when we assume we can measure the linear velocities because it's just a dot product. Um, and so we can organize those. Now the, the derivatives of these are measurable measurable matrix. Um, another part of this, uh, what we need, what we want to do is estimate these constant distances, the initial ones, uh, and then use those, as I showed before, um, the time varying distances are just a function of the constant distances, distances, sorry. Um, and we want to show that relationship. So what we do is uh, 
integral concurrent learning, uh, where I really just integrate the, the dynamics that I just showed on the previous slide over some interval iota. And over that interval, uh, we just are saving up uh, pieces of that data. So what you end up getting is just this delta uh, here, this uh, the psi minus psi, oh, after you've had that much time pass, uh, and it gets you this, this script y. And then the script u is just the integral of your motion over that time, uh, which again is measurable. So both y and u are both measurable. And we can do this for multiple data points over time once that, once that time window is accumulated. And we save a bunch of these data points up, um, kind of like a replay buffer. Uh, we call it the history stack. Uh, but it's just a set of these points. And once you've gotten sufficient number of data points, um, and in this case, you really only need one, uh, but you want to have more uh, just in practice because you get better estimates, um, you're able to invert this, the sigma y or the sigma script y, uh, and you're able to calculate what that initial distance is, um, just as I show here with that script x. And similarly, you can get the time varying distances uh, as a function of that script x, like I show here at the bottom. So how do we use that for our estimators? The, what we do is we define these tracking errors, or these estimation errors, sorry. Um, and it's just the D tildes, one for each of the, of the distances. And we design these estimators to essentially have a feed for term just from the dynamics uh, before the sufficient time has passed where you've collected enough data points. Um, but after that, we're able to just use that history stack of data and get this other term to calculate what the distance is directly. Um, and you can do that for each of these estimators. Uh, and you end up with this kind of a form of the dynamic, the error dynamics, where each of them after that time period is passed, after you've collected enough data, um, it's just a, a negative function of itself. But there's way to, uh, kind of motivated by uh, Ushwin's pa previous paper, uh, we kind of want to introduce this flow-like term um, or an optical flow-like term, uh, which is really the derivative of the unit vectors. In this case, we have to make estimates of those because that's not a directly measurable thing. Um, but what we can show is that you can get a form for uh, this relationship where you have this uh, Z transpose Z, or, uh, yeah. and the time varying distance, and that's just equal to this other term on the right, just Z transpose rho. Um, and in this case, rho is a measurable since we know what the linear velocities are. And then uh, z is also measurable. Uh, but we assume we, ha we have to make estimates of the derivative of the directions. But uh, the angular velocities are measurable. And the reason that we want to do this is, as we show here, before the time has passed, we're able to introduce this other term. It is a more noisy term because we're numerically uh, taking numerical derivatives, um, but you can improve the convergence um, we, in this way, to where over time you have this uh, additional term mu that has just that has that feed forward elements from the dynamics, but you also have this additional term from the flow. Um, and before time is before we had a, a sufficient excitation or sufficient amount of data collected, you'll have this form and so if over that time um, it's positive definite at any point in time, you know, you're gonna have decreases in the air. Um, and then after we've collected enough data, it increases, it's only going to increase your eigenvalue. So it's only gonna increase your, your rate of uh, decay for the tracking errors for the distance or the estimation error, sorry. Um, so, but we can't guarantee that this is going to be positive definite. Um, we, can, we can say though that it will be semi-definite. Um, and showing an analysis for this, uh, what you end up with is before 
uh, or we use a Lyapunov based approach to, to prove the stability of this estimator. Um, and before we just have a, a simple Lyapunov function, it's just the, the tracking error or the estimation errors. Um, and before we've collected enough data, we can upper bound that by zero. So it's not growing, it's just we can only guarantee that it stays flat. Um, but after we've collected enough data, we have this convergence rate where we know actually what we actually know what the convergence rate is and we can calculate that. Um, and so we get this form um, where we know that once we have sufficient excitation, uh, we can actually uh, determine what the uh, rate of convergence is. And we also know, um, you know, we can estimate at least where the, um, where the error is at, as that at a certain time. Um, the way that we could do that is if we know a bound on A to zero, so maybe we have some, uh, you know, arbitrary upper bound on, on the distances, then we can say, based off of that, if the upper bound has converged below some, some amount, then we know that R is also, that our actual distances have converged uh, to some epsilon. Um, and I don't, I don't use that in this, but in uh, some results I'll show in just a moment, um, kind of how it, we can take advantage of that. Um, so we have nice convergence results for this. Um, and we were in some experiments, uh, 15 of them to sh kind of show where kind of compared to um, a couple other methods, uh, compared to Ashwin, his, his previous method, um, and also to a extended Kalman filter. And also just, I compare the two methods that I showed here for estimating the um, the distances or the time varying distance to the feature um, between not using the flow term and using the flow term. And you can really see how the flow term uh, dramatically improves performance. Um, so there's 48 features here uh, and we're using a, mo a motion capture system to uh, track and get the true true values for, for these. So um, here's the path of the 15 experiments. It's just kind of kind of all over the place, but you can see that they're not uh, they're not all just along the same exact path. They all vary um, to some extent. And this is just for one of the one of the results, but they all were roughly in this uh, this level of accuracy. Um, and you can see that the X, Y, and Z positions are relatively accurate. Um, and you can kind of tell like the, the, the norm of the distance error uh, is also pretty good um, under five centimeters. So, and here's a plot kind of showing a comparison between uh, the four methods. And this is a sum of the, uh, uh, oh, I, I did this in the, the depths, the Z element, because Ashwin's paper and other, the EKF uh, typically do inverse depth. I just wanted to show it in a common frame um, so that it was easier to understand um, and more directly related. Um, but you can see that for the red one, that's the estimator that I developed without the flow term. It kind of just does this, uh, drop once you've collected enough data, this black line here representing the time where a sufficient amount of data was collected. You can see right at that point, you have really nice exponential convergence. Um, but the other three methods, they're all converging well before that. Um, the green, um, that's Ashwin's paper. It, you can see it has really fast convergence, um, but after it's converged, there's a little bit more noise. Uh, and then the EKF, it has a little bit slower convergence, but it has a low amount of noise. Um, and for the method where I combine a flow term with uh, the uh, just the ICL term, you can see you have a fast convergence, and then after it's converged, the you have very low uh, residual noise. So it performs it performs pretty well. Um, and I kind of summarize that. Uh, and I, I show three tables here. The first table is showing over the entire time period uh, for an experiment. So this is just RMS errors. Um, 
And what you end up seeing is that the EKF and the, um, the second estimator I showed uh, perform pretty similarly. Um, really all of these perform uh, relatively similarly, uh, Ushwin's and the EKF and then the second estimator. Um, but if you look just before, before you've learned enough information or uh, before you've collected sufficient amount of data, um, again, you kind of see that they're very similar. Um, but if you just look at the time period after you've collected sufficient data, you can see that the second estimator uh, that I showed has a lot better uh, performance. So the results show that this, this method works pretty well. Um, and the benefits of this is it's, a, it's exponentially converging, um, as I showed, after you've collected sufficient data. Uh, and we're able to calculate or approximate that bound of, of that convergence. Um, and it shows that we show that it has pretty low RMS error compared to um, other approaches. And we don't require the positive depth constraint, which as I said, is, is I think really important for target tracking applications. Um, some of the challenges though, is how do you use this to estimate over large distances where objects are constantly leaving your field of view? This is for, this is more of a, like a visual geometry type problem. Um, also estimating moving objects, which is a, you know, kind of a structure of motion for motion type problem. Um, but you know, this is the target tracking type problem. Or what if you have multiple agents that you're trying to do tracking with? Um, and then th these are three problems that uh, I'm beginning to look at and some of our, my research is looking at. Um, this other one, dense estimation, I feel that's a, a really interesting problem um, that I am not sure how to extend this to yet, um, or if even if there is a way to extend it to dense estimation. Um, but I've seen a lot of really interesting papers recently on um, dense estimation approaches. Um, and then the final thing, which I don't really address yet, uh, is noise compensation. Um, you know, this is a deterministic estimator. Um, there, you could add in some elements of that, uh, of noise compensation. Also bias, um, you know, trying to get rid of bad data points. Uh, well, outliers are leading to a bias in your estimates. Uh, so if we can figure out ways of removing these outliers reliably um, to overall improve estimates, um, I feel like those are really important areas to look at. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna show here is more of a visual odometry type problem. Um, and this is just a, a turtle bot with a camera driving around um, over time. And what, we're, what I'm showing here is you have, um, the red is true and green is the estimate of the pose of the ground vehicle. And over time, I'm constantly getting new features, adding it, and then estimating the distance of those features uh, to then go and estimate the position of the camera. Um, and what you see over time, there are the two sets of uh, converging parts here. Um, red is the true, is the true value of where those features were. Um, and then the blue shows the second estimator um, that I developed. So you can really see the convergence of each of those points is a lot faster. The green is just using the first estimator I showed. Um, and one of the important things of this that, I'm, that I wanna show is um, how do we know when we should add data points to estimate our position? When should we say that we've learned these points and that those should be used. Um, and that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, uh, very briefly, about if we know some upper bound on what the distance is, then once we've had sufficient excitation, we're able to calculate how far uh, the largest upper bound for our distance would have converged. Um, and so once that's sufficiently small, then we can say that we should take this data point and add it to our pose estimation component. Um, so in each of these, I'm only using uh, data points uh, to estimate the position if those data points have sufficiently converged, um, which really will change the performance uh, pretty drastically. Um, the other part of this uh, that you can kind of see as it gets further on down here 
and that I haven't really worked into it yet is loop closure detection. And so I've gone all the way around here in this case, um, you know, I think it's about 40 meters track or something. Um, once I, I'm using this checkerboard as a simple landmark, just because, you know, it's a little bit harder to use plywood as a, as a landmark. Um, not impossible, but hard. And once, once we've gotten to this point where we see it again, uh, you know, I'm not implementing it here, but what I'd like to start doing is some type of a pose graph optimization to kind of go back and fix all of the positions and perform an actual loop closure. So that's something that I haven't added into this yet, um, but I'd like to add that in. And then uh, this will be some results that I, I try to publish on that. Um, we'd also like to do some outdoor experiments with this uh, before, but you can see that the even before any optimization, um, this approach does pretty good. Uh, you have drift over time, but it's um, it's doing a decent job at minimizing drift. Um, another part is for the um, oops. Another part is for uh, moving objects. So in this case, you you have this um, just this paper plate. What does it look like as you're trying to track this and move it around? Um, you know, that's it's a really challenging problem uh, to do both your own pose and velocity estimates um, and estimate the motion. Um, but starting to look at that and trying to specifically estimate motion models, um, kind of like what Randy was talking about, um, except instead of taking um, a linear approach, uh, what we're starting to look at is taking general neural networks. Um, and I only have a little bit more here. Um, and so the main problem with that is, let's say that we do have um, multiple agents trying to track some target uh, going through, and you, not, you maybe you can't necessarily keep uh, track of it the whole time using a single agent, because um, maybe you have this no-fly zone that's separating all of your operating regions. Um, so each of these agents is going to be tracking this little mobile target, M. Um, and what they're doing over time is they're trying to just build up this motion model. This is some preliminary results we published in CDC um, last year. And what we're doing, what we're looking at is extending this result uh, to using uh, a little bit more advanced uh, machine learning type algorithms and combining those with adaptive control methods um, to try and develop a little bit more advanced motion models, uh, really trying to look at how can we extrapolate into these regions where, uh, like, like what Warren had talked about, how do, you, how do you know throughout these pieces where you have these gaps, um, the way that the, the model is going to, or the target is going to move. Um, and so what we're hoping is to figure out ways of structuring networks to be able to improve that prediction and evaluating that prediction so that as the target leaves one operating region and one camera's field of view, we can inform our neighbor, hey, go to this location so that you can pick up and reacquire the target and continue tracking it. Um, and yeah, with that, is there any questions? Thanks, Zach. Very yeah. cool talk. Thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I want to see if there are any questions from the audience before I ask uh, my questions. And uh, let me see. Wait a sec. Are there so, any questions? Um, let's see. Maybe finite time convergence. Have you looked at any estimators with finite time convergence? I haven't looked at any of those yet. Um, I have seen some of those. And I'd like to try and incorporate something like that into this. Um, I just haven't gotten a, a chance to really start looking at those. And we don't have finite time convergence here, um, like you're pointing out, uh, but we are able to calculate what that convergence rate is uh, once we've collected a sufficient amount of data. And really, what to get it faster, you just have to collect, um, you know better data or, or more data, that's that's one way of getting it to converge faster or letting it run for longer, um, which isn't necessarily what you want in a finite time type of scenario, but that's that's where we're at right now. Um, 
and then Warren methods to learn from stored data even when out of the field of view. Um, this is more of, are you able to extrapolate into those regions um, that you haven't had interactions with the, with the target? So not necessarily able to learn when it's out of the field of view, but are we able to figure out methods of improving prediction when it's outside of the field of view? Um, that's, that's more what I meant. And we have one more question, Zach, uh, in the chat. If you can oh, it. I didn't see that. Um, which one? I, I, I don't see that one. Um, Patricia is asking, is the goal to get absolute motion or relative motion? The goal is... And, and oh, relative I, I just motion see compared to a moving object. Okay. Um, so the goal right now is really we're, we're only able to get relative motion. Um, no worries. Uh, right now we're trying to get relative motion between a keyframe and the current frame. So you have more of these delta poses. Um, absolute motion, um, you know, we were not really able to get it into a global. I mean, if you have a landmark, maybe that you knew global location of, you could put it into a global frame. Um, but most of this will be trying to reference everything uh, to say, let's, let's if I have a set of vehicles, um, you know, maybe they all start at a common location. We'll all try to reference to that. Um, but it would, there would be some other methods or other, uh, things required to get it into a, like a geo, uh, uh, global location. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the number of features to get distance. Um, so really the number of features that we need is going to be the minimum is four for homography methods, um, to calculate your direction of motion. Um, I would like to use Kaveh's method or his quest algorithms method is, is very nice uh, and is better than, than homography methods that I've seen. Um, and it's nice because it extends to if you have non-complainers points. Uh, so I'd say that in, in general, five is for non-planer, um, but that's, yeah, that's what you would need.